Um, yeah, so I just got back from India this week, Friday night, I believe, yeah. Uh, I was there 10 days, um, and I just want to thank you for your prayers and your support during that time. Um, it was a really good time to really see how there's a lot of leaders and disciples, true disciples, um, that are really arising in India. Um, and it was amazing to see how, how God's working there. And even I received grace, even though I was giving messages, like almost, yeah, I was giving messages every day, like two or three. Um, but even for me, it was a time of grace because, you know, so many people, even pastors that I was, um, that I was you know, giving messages with, um, they too were coming to the realization for the first time that Jesus is the Christ. Um, you know, they said that they had read the Bible so many times, but they really didn't know what it was about. They were just reading it. And these are pastors. And some of them have churches that are like 500 people in the church. But then after kind of this time of training, they said they finally understood that the gospel, that the Bible is really, it's all pointing to Christ and who that is. Um, and a lot of them came to realize the gospel. Um, so it's amazing to see how God is really working in India. Um, I hope that you guys can continue to support that ministry and pray for um, that country. Um, and also Sam, he's headed there um, this week, one day. Um, so keep him in your prayers as well. Uh, today we're going to look at, um, you know, as Dave mentioned, um, Ezra, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're doing this because we're going through this series, continuing to go through this series of looking at just the Old Testament books. Um, and last time we went through Obadiah, and the time before that we were in Daniel and Esther. And we were looking at kind of the time when the Israelites, they were in Babylon, Babylon and then Persia. Uh, but now through these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, we're kind of switching back to after captivity, they're starting to get sent back to their homes in Jerusalem. And kind of the reason that we're kind of skipping around so much, um, like Dave mentioned, is because I'm kind of going in, not the order of the Bible, but in the chronological order. So the books, they're kind of put in, book, in, in groups. So, you know, there's historical books, you know, there's songs, and there's books of major prophets, minor prophets, and they're grouped. So I'm going through them in the order of time. So that's why it kind of makes more sense to me. Because <laughs> I didn't really understand the Old Testament at all until I started doing this. Um, but now I'm understanding it more and more as well. Um, so now this is Ezra and Nehemiah, and these are historic books. And Chronicles is a historic book too. So they're grouped together. So Chronicles, um, it was talking about, you know, it's a historic book about the kings of Judah. And now Ezra and Nehemiah are also historic books talking about the return from captivity. And we're doing this together. Ezra um, and Nehemiah, we're doing them together because actually this used to be one book. Originally this was one historic book, but they split it into hook two. You know, Ezra one and Ezra two. But now over time it became, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, but since it's one book, uh, we'll cover it together. Um, so this is about the restoration of God's people after their exile in Babylon. So the time period is about 440 B.C. Uh, and it's 50 years after Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, they're starting to be sent back to their country, to their cities. Okay. Um, so the, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, it really they just focus on three leaders. So just these three people. Uh, Zerubbabel, um, he's the first leader. And he's sent back to rebuild the altar and the temple. And he's a governor of that region. And then later on, many years later, uh, we have Ezra is sent back. And Ezra is a scribe. And he's sent back to teach the law, to teach the Torah to the people, and do some social reforms. And then after that, we have Nehemiah. He's another leader. And he's sent back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he actually helps Ezra, too, do some social reforms. Uh, but before going through the message, uh, we have to understand some important things that happened, um, especially during this time of captivity. Um, and it's very important not only for understanding today's message, but it also helps us understand why Jews are the way they are today. So first, you know, while they're in captivity, um, they take this time and they're reflecting back on what happened. Why was the city destroyed? Why was Jerusalem destroyed? Why were we taken captives? You know, why did these things happen to us? And they conclude that the problems are the result of really not holding on to the law of Moses. 
Um, and so they see that it's important for us to emphasize the law more. So they start emphasizing the law, and especially they, get, they become more legalistic. And so we see a couple of things happen in the absence of the temple as well, because they don't have the temple while they're in captivity. So the first thing that happens is, while they're in captivity, they start having these things called rooms of prayer. So these rooms of prayer, um, they arise all throughout Babylon, and these are prayer rooms or prayer houses where the Jews, they can actually worship God. And um, then, um, the next thing is, you know, they saw that the problem is we didn't hold on to the law. So they start seeing the importance of studying the law, and they open up these houses to study and understand the law of God, the law of Moses. So if you combine these two together, we have, you know, the house of prayer and worship and the house of studying God's law. If you combine them together, later on that becomes what we call the synagogue. And that's how the synagogue began. It actually began from this time period. Um, that's how the synagogue movement arose. The second thing that kind of comes out of this time period um, is we have a couple new groups that are starting to arise. Um, because once again, they saw that the reason we were destroyed was we didn't hold to God's law. We didn't understand it. We didn't devote ourselves. We didn't obey it well enough. <coughs> and so there arises this group where their job is just to be experts in the law of Moses, in the law of God. And so these people, they make copies of the law so it can be spread out. And they have to know it extremely well. And because they know it extremely well, they begin teaching it to the people as well. So these people, they're called scribes. And Ezra, he is a scribe. You know, sometimes these people are thought of as lawyers because they're experts in the law of God. And then another group um, that comes from this devotion to the law, it actually doesn't come out at this time, but a few, you know, hundred years later actually. But we're going to start to see something called the Pharisees. They start to come out from this time period. Because these are individuals, they're not priests, um, but they're very zealous when it comes to the law. Um, they live by the law and living by God's traditions. They're very legalistic and believe it's a rigid observance, observance to the law. You have to follow the law exactly. Uh, and in a way we'll see Nehemiah, he's kind of like one of these characters. Kind of like the start of a kind of Pharisee type of person. And so later on, if you look at the history of the church, you know, you'll see, especially, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders at the time of Jesus. And these are the ones that Jesus is always getting into arguments with, always fighting with, um, because they're so legalistic. They're all about the law. And finally, the third thing that comes, comes about during this period is, um, you know, they're very zealous about keeping the law, traditions, and because they're like that, they feel like they have to be pure more pure, and not mingle with other nations, more than in the past. And so they certainly have this chosen people identity, and their pride grows stronger. And so the result of these things is really that, actually, instead of drawing closer to God's heart, instead of drawing closer to understanding God, the Jews, they start following this path more towards legalism, and more towards tradition than ever before. Um, so let's start looking at the book, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and these three leaders and we'll see a lot of these three leaders they're very similar they all have this big start they're all commissioned by the king at that time the king of Babylon or the king of Persia at that time and so the first person we're going to look at is Zerubbabel um, he is commissioned back to Jerusalem under the reign of Cyrus it says in Ezekiel 1.1 to fulfill the word of Jeremiah the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and put it in writing. The Lord has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and provide those with a free will offering for the temple of God. Then in verse 5, Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Okay, so the first point we're going to look at today is Rupabel. Uh, this group, he would be a governor of the region. And his name means planted in Babylon. As planted in Babylon, that's his name because he represents this first generation. It's this generation that was born in captivity. 
So they're being born in captivity and they're coming out. And with him comes this large group to rebuild the temple. You know, Cyrus even gave articles that were originally taken by Nebuchadnezzar um, that they're actually restoring to the temple. And so with Zerubbabel, there's around 50,000 people, 50,000 captives, they begin returning. And this group includes priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and temple servants. So mainly the people that are devoted to the temple, because that's what he was called to do. So Zerubbabel, the priests, um, they begin rebuilding the temple. They first start with the altar. The altar, and they do everything according to the law of Moses. It says in chapter 3, verse 3, Despite their fear of the people, they built the altar, and they sacrificed, both morning and evening. And they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. So they built the altar, that's the first step, and they begin to build the temple. And this is where we come to the passage we read today. You know, they're rebuilding the temple. But to me, I think they make a mistake here. It says, When the enemies of Judah heard that the exiles were rebuilding the temple of the Lord, they came to Zerubbabel and said, Let us help you build. Because like you, we seek your God. And have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esharadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So this seems to be a good thing, right? You know, they're building a temple, and all these people, they want to help. Let us help you build this. We seek your God. We want to worship your God. And this seems to fulfill a lot of scripture, pointing to how, you know, the kingdom of God is coming. All the nations are going to worship God. It seems like a good thing. But then how did they respond? It says in verse 4, But Zerubbabel and the rest of the families answered, You have no part with us in the building of our temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. You know, to me, after reading this, it just pointed out kind of how selfish the Jewish people had become at this point. You know, they have this chosen people identity. Um, you know, they believe they're the only ones that can worship God. They want to keep the temple and their God all to themselves, and they don't care about other people. They don't care about sharing this message. They don't care about evangelism. And they outright refuse to share this way of salvation to other people. And then at the setting of the foundation of the temple, they set the foundation, and they begin praising the Lord. But then it says, as they were praising the Lord, the older priests, they were weeping. For they had seen the former temple, and they saw how this one compared to the former one, and they cried. So at the same time, you hear people praising God, like this new generation, they're amazed, and then the older generation, they're weeping, they're sad over it just how things have become. And then looking at what happens after they make this decision to refuse the people, there's a repercussion of refusing the people. That says, you know, the people around them whom they refuse to allow to help, they set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. So they lodge accusations against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. They're restoring the walls and they're repairing the foundations. It says, because these people are angry, they start using politics against the Israelites. They petition the king that if the city is built, these walls are restored, they will no longer pay taxes, they will no longer pay tribute, they will no longer do their duty. So they recommend to the king to look at the history of the Israelites. What kind of people are they actually? And if they look at the history, they'll see why the city was destroyed. Because it is rebellious. So the king receives this letter and he does his research. And he discovers, hey, this is true. This is right. So he actually issues a decree to make them stop working. So thus, the work of the house of God in Jerusalem, it came to a standstill. So they had to stop building the temple. You know, why does this happen? Why did it turn out this way for them? You know, how do you think the Israelites took this? You know, we're forced to stop. We're building this temple of God and we're forced to stop building. I think one of the ways they look at it is we're victims. You know, we're trying to worship God. We're trying to praise God. And this opposition came. It's against us. It's against God. You know, we're being persecuted for our faith. We must rise above it because we are the victims here. 
And this is what they did. You know, this is how they saw it. You know, thus they tried to find a way to overcome it. Because they were victims. But when I look at this, I see a different truth. I see that they were selfish. They didn't want to share the blessing of the temple, the blessing of God's presence with anyone. And they ultimately just saw themselves as victims because they were only looking out for themselves. They didn't care about other people. They just care about themselves and how things seem to them. And so the Israelites, to overcome this problem that they're facing as victims, they come up with a plan. So Zerubbabel and the people, they have this new plan. And it takes patience. And they wait. They wait till there's a new king in Persia. And they begin building the temple again. And they write a letter to the new king for him to check the archives and see how Cyrus issued this original decree for them to build the temple. So he's asking this new king, hey, go back to the beginning and look, King Cyrus issued this decree. We're supposed to build this. And so I think this is very kind of sneaky. Isn't it? Kind of crafty. Um, they're kind of using some humanism and craftiness because they're waiting for this new king and they ask him to check the records from before how they were supposed to build the temple but not telling him what happened after. So I think it's very smart. And so of course, Darius, the new king, he reassures the decree and it's actually now everything is paid for by the treasury. So they continue to build um, and this is a kind of a time when they're building and there's prophecies from Haggai, um, Zechariah, who are prophets in the Bible. Uh, they're kind of prophesying during this time. And they end up finishing this temple. And they have all these sacrifices. They install the people to the positions. And then they celebrate the Passover. Um, it says in chapter 622, They celebrated with joy because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing their attitude of King Assyria. So that he insisted them, so that he assisted them in the work of the temple. Uh, so kind of the first point that I want to make here is kind of what do we learn from this situation about the Israelites and how they do things? We see after returning from captivity, um, they're able to complete this work of the temple. But I think what they did and what they were able to complete, it wasn't necessarily the power of God that was with them. It was actually through their deceit, through their craftiness, deceiving the king into changing his orders to aid them. And it's interesting because after they're able to kind of deceive and trick the king to help them, they celebrate. They're like, look at what you accomplished. You know? And as I saw them you know, celebrating and have this joy, I was thinking, is this really joy from God? Is this joy from the Lord? Or is this really joy from what they were able to do through their own effort, through their own craftiness, through their own deceit? Why are they celebrating so much? And the other thing is after they complete the after they complete the temple, something doesn't happen that should happen. You know, normally at the dedication of the temple, um, God would actually appear to the people. His presence would fill the temple, and He would make Himself known. This would show that God was with us. He's in this temple. He's with us. But that didn't happen. In the past, it happened. In Leviticus, at the altar of the tent of meeting, in Leviticus 9, 23, it says, Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. So God was with them at the tent of meeting. His presence was known. And then later... They build the temple. In 1 King 8, Solomon dedicates the temple and the ark is brought in. It says in verse 10, When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. This is what was supposed to happen. But what happened after they completed the temple? The second temple the presence of God didn't return. There's something different here. So the next thing we're going to look at is Ezra, the scribe. So he comes about 60 years after Zerubbabel. 
It says in chapter 7, verse 6, it says, Ezra was given favor of the king of Persia. He had devoted himself to the study and observation and observance of the law of the Lord and to the teaching of his decrees and law in Israel. He was sent to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. And so he's doing kind of a, a type of social reform to the people. And with him, it's a smaller group that comes. It's only about 1,500 people. They make it safely there, of course. They do sacrifice. But then we see also for Ezra, this legalism starts to come out. It says, many of the exiles at this time that were living in Jerusalem and this region, a lot of them had married non-exiles, so foreigners that were in the region. And so Ezra, he gets out the book, the Torah, and he commands them, you are to be a holy and separate people. He commands them to do a repentance prayer. And this is his prayer in chapter 9. He says, some have mingled the holy race with the people around them. So after some anger and anguish, he prays to God. He prays for the sin of polluting this land. And all the people gather together and they confess their sin as well. And then, Ezra issues a divorce decree. And this is new. This is his decree regarding those that had married foreigners. He says, send away all those women and their children. Because he sees marriage as wrong. And he actually makes this law. He gives this law to divorce, to just get rid of your families if you're married to a foreigner. But here's the thing. You know, God never commanded this. God, you know, God is actually opposed to divorce. Um, for those of you that are married, God wants you to stay married. You know, he doesn't want you to get divorced. There's only a special situation where he does allow divorce. And it's usually only for, like, unfaithfulness um, from the partner. But here in Ezra, he just creates his new law. He creates this new law. And the criteria for the new law is simply, if you're married to a foreigner, get a divorce. And so this becomes a law in the land. Why? Because Ezra and the leaders just decided it. So this becomes kind of the word of God now. Whatever they create as a law becomes the law. And what's interesting, if you actually look at the history of the church, the Catholic church was becoming corrupt, they actually kind of do the same thing. The Catholic church just created new laws and new things just based on their own words. They were able to give forgiveness of sins by selling indulgences and things. You now these things were found in the Bible. They just created these things. And we see this, this new legalism is really entering into the Israelites at this time. So they gather all the people, and Ezra says, You have been unfaithful, you have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now make a confession to the Lord and do His will. Separate yourselves from the people around you, from your foreign wives. And the assembly responded, You are right. So they're all together following this new law. And so you see, here is where legalism is entering the people. New laws created by man, simply in their zeal, in their excitement to follow and obey God. You know, the danger of legalism is that it's always done out of good motives. You know, people that are legalistic, it's because they want to please God. They want to obey God. You know, they, want to, they have good motives. They desire to please God but they become more strict and there's more rules and it becomes more about effort and keeping these laws than anything else. And this does not please God. You know, God desires us to really just turn to Him in faith, to trust Him for salvation, to trust in His covenant and His word, to have a relationship with Him. But instead, they just turn to the law. They turn to legalism for the answer. So they're told, Get rid of your wives. You know, get rid of your children. Does this make sense? You know, this is the way for them to overcome their sin. Rid themselves of the defilement by ridding themselves of their families. Throw them out. Is basically what he's saying. And this is how Ezra ends, the book of Ezra. Ezra ends with a list of people that simply divorced their wives and got rid of their children. And then we come to the third leader that arises in Nehemiah, which is Nehemiah himself. 
Nehemiah, he is a cupbearer for the king, the king of Persia. And this is a very trusted position because the cupbearer, of course, you know, if someone's trying to poison the king, they have to taste the wine or whatever he's drinking before the king does. So he's in a position where he himself could actually kill the king if he wanted to. So it's a very trusted position he's in. And he receives a letter from the remnant of Israel, of Jerusalem. And in Nehemiah 1.3 it says, Those who survived exile are going back in the province, I mean, sorry, those who survived exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So he mourns and he prays to God for the opportunity to go back and help the people. And he goes to the king, he petitions the king, and he's granted favor, and his request is granted. And he's sent back to go rebuild the wall. So just like the others, Ezra and Zerubbabel, he's sent back by the king, commissioned by the king of Persia. So Nehemiah, he begins his work rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and he gains the help of many people. He has many people to help him rebuilding this wall because it's a lot of work. Uh, but once again, we see that the foreigners, they want to help. And once again, he turns away their help. And so there are those now that are actively opposed to him. So when he's fully engaged, he's rebuilding this wall. They call to him to come down from the wall and away from finishing his work. And Nehemiah's response is this. He says, I am doing a great work. So I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down to you? So he's, he's very prideful in what he's doing. You know, he has a lot of zeal for God. He wants to rebuild God's temple. And he's like, I'm doing a great work here. You know, look at, look at my work. And we see, once again, it's this nature of legalism, this work, this, this nature of really putting our effort in, putting our work in to please God. And so finally there's a time when, when the, the construction is all completed, the walls are done, the gates are done. And it says, after building the gates, the first thing he does, of course, he closes them. He closes all the gates of the city and issues this order. The gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. Have the gatekeepers shut the doors and bar them. So he has strict rules regarding, you know, what people could actually enter the temple what people can enter the city. So the gates are not just for protection. They're a way to keep people out, to keep people away from entering the city. And this is all for the sake of purity, for the sake of keeping this, this chosen people, just chosen to keep them pure and not defiled by other people, by other foreigners. And as, as I was reading this and, you know, building the gates and closing people out, I started thinking about myself and about churches. And you know, I noticed this is something that we all do, even ourselves, building these walls up. We build up a lot of walls to keep people out. You know, Cyrus, he was a foreigner, he actually commissioned them to build it, and yet they're denying foreigners access to it. They built these walls to keep out people that were not the Israelites. And I was thinking, don't we do the same thing? We, we build up walls to protect ourselves. You know, the world is wicked. I mean, you look at America, it's just going downhill. There's so many drugs and problems in this world. And so we try to protect ourselves. We try to separate ourselves from that world and make our own world, our own community, our own culture, to protect ourselves from the wicked world outside. You know, this is absolutely what we do. To protect our children, we build walls to keep them safe. But in keeping us in, we're keeping others out. We want to be separate from the world. Now, how often do we do this and it ends up keeping others from hearing the gospel? To keep ourselves separate, to keep ourselves safe from this world. And we do this, and yet we're just keeping the gospel only for ourselves. You know, we're not building bridges with people. We're not opening doors to people. We just like to be comfortable and safe, protected, and just enjoy this ourselves. And I think this is where we need balance. You know, to be in the world and to be out of the world at the same time. Because of course, the treasure, this gospel is a treasure. This treasure that we all have. We have Christ. You know, the scriptures say this is a treasure. But this treasure is not meant just for ourselves. This treasure of Christ, the treasure of the gospel, 
It's meant to be shared to people. That's what we're meant to do. So finally at the book of Nehemiah, you know, we have this period where Nehemiah, they actually joined forces, Nehemiah and Ezra. They joined forces to reform the people of Israel together. And we look at Nehemiah 8. Ezra reads the law. It says, All the people assemble as one man before the gate. Ezra the scribe reads out the book of the law of Moses. Ezra standing above them reads the book. And the people bow down. They worship the Lord. And the Levites, they actually help people to understand God's word. They built booths on their roofs. And this is during the time of the feast or the festival of tabernacles. So they're celebrating the festival, and day after day, Ezra is reading from the book of the law, and they're celebrating this for seven days. And then after the seven days, they make this commitment, this devotion, this promise to obey God. So regarding the inner marriage, they say, we promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the people around us. We promise that we will bring grain on the Sabbath and not buy it. We promise to give money for the house of the Lord. We promise to give our fruit, fruit, our first fruits of the crops. We promise to bring our firstborn cattle, herds as often. We promise to give tithe. There's all these promises, these commitments. And then they have the dedication of the wall. With the priests and Levites, they purify the people. They purify the gates and the walls. And Israel, Ezra is leading this procession. It says, On that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing the Lord, because the Lord had given them great joy. But then we see right away they make a mistake. And it comes back to this ideology of chosen people, of you know, purity, of legalism. In chapter 13 it says, On the day the book of the Moses, on the day the book of Moses was read aloud, they were told that no Ammonite, no Moabite would ever be admitted to the assembly of God. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all those who were of foreign descent. So even those that were born, you know, and mixed with Israel's family, they were all kicked out of the city. They were all excluded from this. And so what is the result of all this work? So what happened? So Nehemiah ends up going back to Persia because he was just there a short time. And a few years later, many years later, he returns to check on the condition. So how did all this work that he and Ezra were doing? How did all this end up? Years later, he comes back. And on his return, he tours the city to check everything out and how it is. And as he tours, he sees that everything that he had done is all undone. We see the work of Zerubbabel, of building the temple. We see now the temple is neglected. You know, people that shouldn't be there are there. You know, the portions that were supposed to be given to the Levites are not given. All the rules are not kept. They're all doing things out of order. Nothing is going right. The temple is neglected. All the work of Ezra in giving them the law, they're all violating the law. People are working on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah, he gets angry and he starts instructing the people, you know, return and, and start following the law, follow the Sabbath. And even the work of Nehemiah, all his work in building this wall, he has these merchants that begin stationing themselves all along the wall to sell goods. And he yells at them to stop. So Nehemiah, he's doing all these things that he thinks are good. And so he, he says to God, he asks God to see, look at this work. Look at my effort in getting these people to follow these social reforms of him and Ezra. And we see, though, that all these works, all these social reforms, the law that they were trying to impress on the people, none of it worked. None of it lasted. The people ended up returning to their old nature, their old ways. And he just tries through effort and through work to change them. And as he's trying to change them and getting them to follow the law, he actually ends up turning to violence, physically enforcing the law himself, especially about intermarriage. He thinks that's terrible. You have to be pure. So in chapter 22, verse 23, it says, In those days I saw the men of Judah married women, from Ashad, Ammon, and Moab. Half their children spoke the language of Ashad or other people, but they didn't know the language of Judah. So he's angry because the children, they can't speak you know, their language, the language of Judah. They're speaking foreign languages. He's so angry. And he says, I rebuked them and called curses down on them. 
I beat some of the men and pulled their hair. You are being unfaithful to God by marrying foreign women. And this is how Nehemiah ends. <laughs> Nehemiah ends with him simply saying to God, Remember me for this, O God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of God and his services. You know, he's basically saying, look at my works, look at my deeds. Um, so in conclusion, kind of looking at this once again, you're looking at Ezra and Nehemiah. You're actually, most people, they look at these books and they actually point out how pleasing to God these people are. Like Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, they're very zealous. They're very zealous for God. And they desire to please them. And in a way, they're right. It's good, in a way. Um, you know, they devoted themselves to God's work and will. They had this heart, really, to obey God, to worship Him, to please Him. But, you know, as I examined this book and as I went over it, I don't know, God just opened my eyes to see something different. And I saw, you know, all these people during this period, it seemed like the time when the gospel began to leave. The gospel was leaving, and instead religion was coming in. More legalism, more traditions. That became the focus of everything. Yeah, and so what commenters, a lot of commenters say, this was good things for them to do all these things. And I see a lot of mistakes here. You know, instead of opening the door of evangelism, instead of opening the door to the kingdom of God during this period, they shut the doors, and they built these walls to keep people away from meeting God. You know, they begin forcing new created laws that they made themselves all in an effort to keep themselves pure. So the Israelites, they're back in the promised land just as God said they would. He fulfilled his promise. But it seems like they returned and their spiritual state is the same as before. Nothing changed. They still have this state where they're, you know, sinful. They can't follow the law. It's not in their nature. And so for Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, they try to do political reform, they try to do social reform, but it all failed. And the reason? They believed the solution to their problems was purity, selfishness, and legalism. But this isn't the answer from God. You know, something had changed during this time of exile. You know, and this resulted in this new religion. Now, this is the time where Judaism, as a religion, you know, as a legalistic way of pleasing God, really begins. And this is modern, you know, these are modern Jews today. They live strictly according to the law. They can't recognize Christ because all they see is we just got to follow the law. So during this time, I think they lost the essence of the gospel. They lost the essence of God's word. And for the sake of national identity and purity, they forced themselves to separate from all nations. During this time, because the temple is destroyed, they focus more on the law and expand, and they get more details about it. You know, what Ezra was doing in, in adding to the law, that continued more and more. They actually created a new book called the Talmud, which is an expansion on the law, going through every little detail about what to do in every situation, every sin. You know, is this a sin? Is this a sin? And giving the details about it. They expand on it. And you see, this is the start of the synagogue. You know, this is where people like Nehemiah, who are zealous in upholding the law, start to arise. People like the Pharisees that lived during the time of Jesus. More and more, you know, they enter this chosen people identity, the holy race mentality. But the leaders, they're very zealous for the law and their own righteousness. But they lack love for others. I think this is a mistake the Israelites made. But I think it's a mistake that a lot of us make too, a lot of churches today. You know, for the sake of purity, they kick out people that don't fit in the church, that look different, that act different. For the sake of protection, they close the doors to sinners that really need Christ. For the sake of salvation, they create more and more burdensome laws for people to follow. You know, this isn't the solution of God. This is man's way. This is an empty religion just based on effort and works. And there's evidence from you know, these books and from the past that this doesn't work. It doesn't change people. It only ends in failure. And it just turns people into legalistic persecutors of others. 
like Nehemiah became, trying to pull out the hair and beat people to obey. But what is the solution that God gives? The solution is Christ. You know, the law is not used to purify us from our sins. It's only to point out our sins to us. The law tells us we are sinners. It doesn't cleanse us. It just points, we are sinners and we need a savior. We fail to keep the law because we are sinners. But because we see ourselves as sinners, we also see we need a savior. And that is why Christ was sent. That's why Christ was sent. To die for our sins in our place. So finally, I just want to close with, you know, where does Christ come out in Ezra? Where does Christ come out in Nehemiah? Now most commenters will say, you know, look at Ezra, look at Nehemiah, they're zealous, how zealous they were, and Jesus was kind of zealous too about, you know, God and following the rules of the temple. Um, but I kind of see something kind of interesting. In Nehemiah 9, there's this really beautiful prayer um, that they offer up to God. And the entire focus of this prayer in Nehemiah is, um, the entire focus is on God and God's covenant. And so they go back, and it goes, it says, from the creation of the time of Abraham to Moses and onward, God has always been a God of giving life, a God of redemption, a God of faithfulness, a God of the covenant, a God of redemption, a God of guidance, a God of righteousness, a God of justice, a God of revelation. He's a God that fulfills his word. And even though the people sin, disobey, are stiff-necked and arrogant and turn away from him, He's forgiving, gracious, and compassionate. He's slow to anger and abounding in love. He fights our battles and reveals his goodness. Even though the people rebel and kill God's prophets, God hears their cries and he rescues them from their enemies. God in his great mercy never abandons us. He is great, mighty, and awesome. And is he God? who keeps the covenant of love. Now this, this prayer is all about God. He's a God of the covenant. How does God fulfill these words? I think it's through Christ. In Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrates his love for us. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, Christ is the fulfillment of the covenant. Genesis 3.15, The offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's head. The covenants given throughout time, the Passover, this is all pointing to God that keeps his promises. And so fulfilling this prayer, a prayer to the God of the covenant, and all these things they say, this I see is Christ. Christ coming out of the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So you see, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, they failed because they saw legalism as the answer. They closed the door to evangelism them to the nations. They were selfish. They tried to live according to the law, issuing laws not given by God. The result is people fail. So what was Nehemiah's answer? Go on a rampage, force them to keep the law, beat them, pull out their hair. But God's answer is Christ. I see Christ is what these people really need. Only Christ can make a person whole. Only Christ can redeem them from their sins. And only through the Spirit of God can they actually gain a new heart? Can they be transformed? You know, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says that it's not by works. It's only by God's grace. The law doesn't save us. Legalism does not purify us from sin. That's why we need Christ. And I think through this book, God is showing us the failure of the people. Even those with good motives, those that are zealous for God, that want to please God, He's showing us that no matter how hard we try, no matter how legalistic or how much effort we put in, that is not the answer. The answer that the world really needs is Christ and Christ alone. And we're called to share that treasure, not just keep it for ourselves. So I pray that this week, you can really come to understand this. You know, are you someone that, that closes the door, that closes the gates, that keeps you away, uh, away from other people to keep yourself safe and pure and holy? 
And of course, you know, those things are good in a way, but we're not called to be separate from the world. You know, we are separate in a way, but we're also going to be in the world. Why? To share the gospel. You know, once we go to heaven, okay, that's different. But while you're still on this earth, we need to proclaim Christ. Share the gospel. Open the doors up. Because there are a lot of people that just like them that seek to worship God. They have a desire to meet God. And you have the answer. And it's not the law. It's not works. It's not effort. Which is all religions. It's through Christ and Christ alone. Okay. Let's pray as we hold on to this message.